All right, guys, you know the drill. I'm Mark, I haven't seen this show before, and today I'll be throwing myself headfirst into its manga to see how good it actually is. You guys have been requesting this one since I covered Hunter x Hunter, which I really enjoyed, even though it dragged me into a depression, the likes of which I narrowly escaped. Also, unlike other stories where I've seen some iconography or have heard some things, with Yu Yu Hakusho, I knew quite literally nothing going in. It wasn't on TV when I was growing up, I didn't know what it was about, I didn't know anyone's name, I didn't even know how to spell the name of this damn story until about 10 minutes ago. Shout out to Google, you're the real one here. Also, also, I have to not only read and review this for the first time, but I need to do it in exactly one month. Because in one month, this arrives, the live-action Netflix adaptation of Yu Yu Hakusho. And I'll be damned if I don't get to either enjoy or hate watch this thing with the rest of the world. So, now that we're all on the same page, I've got about 30 days to read and review this series. Can I do it? Will I enjoy it? Only one way to find out. I'm Mark Fitzpatrick, and this is the series that put Yoshihiro Togashi on the map. A childhood staple for many, but brand new for me. This is Yu Yu Hakusho. I can categorically say that while some manga take a while to warm up for me or might not be my cup of tea off the bat, from the moment I finished the first chapter, Togashi immediately hooked me as a reader. Yu Yu Hakusho is incredible and a tremendously well-written story. The moment you open the cover, you're greeted by the first of many blurbs Togashi decides to write. It is always weird, but in the most Togashi way possible. And right out the gate, I was reacquainted with the beautifully dark style of storytelling Togashi has become world famous for penning. And this story that precedes that weird blurb, while preceding his most famous work, Hunter x Hunter, it is still rich with the blueprints that led him to that very success. Thrusting us into the story from the very first page, we are gripped with intrigue as our main character has died? What? The entire opening chapter therefore acts as a flashback to grant us context for that very inciting incident. And through doing so, Togashi reminds us why he's one of the greats in the manga industry. Sporting a significantly more lighthearted opener compared to that which Hunter x Hunter's corresponding chapters boast, the comedy is extremely prevalent with tons of quick gags emphasized through expressive and cartoonish artwork. But those familiar with Togashi's work understand that this style and approach conceals a far darker edge to his stories. In addition to establishing the fun atmosphere of this story, the main character Yusuke Urameshi's outlook on life, despite his nonchalant and delinquent attitude, is rather bleak. And from the get-go, Togashi bonds us with him very effectively, taking the interesting approach of him doing some minor offenses, all the while others surrounding him count him out or degrade him for things he hasn't done. Underpinned by his young mother heavily implied to be a prostitute, hammering home the difficult circumstances surrounding his upbringing which, interestingly, was omitted entirely from the anime. Having been told time and again that Yusuke is a bad person, someone that relishes in breaking the rules and looking out only for himself, like any great story worth telling, our main character is then offered a moment to reveal to us who he truly is. Immediately, he steals my heart. I love this character. This is the moment that grants us context for what actually happened on that first page. And as it happens, it's a moment that defines Yusuke as a good person in our eyes. Having seen that altruistic act of good, I am now firmly in his corner. And it only took half a chapter for Togashi to achieve this. And he keeps going. Having just learned that he's died from his soon-to-be companion in this early portion, Botan, he reflects a level of calm and introspection the likes you'd never expect from a 14-year-old and one that only can be offered through a rough life. Furthermore, despite all of his sins being called out before him, the only thing he seems concerned about in that moment is that little kid's well-being. Is he okay? Did he manage to save him? He's not concerned about himself. These are small tangents, but they offer an enormous amount of goodwill from me as a reader. I love this sort of stuff. And now, offered a chance to return to the land of the living from King Enma. No, not that one. This one. <laughs> we have the mechanism and plot device that defines this early portion of the story. However, following the conclusion and established stakes within these opening chapters, the story changes in a way that honestly scared me. It turned 
episodic. I'll be the first one to say it. As a general rule of thumb for myself, I don't really like episodic stories. I find them laborious at worst and slightly tedious at best. However, again, Togashi worked his magic here and offered me the first episodic series of chapters I've enjoyed this much in years. Whether it be the dog and his kid owner, the old man chapters, or the corrupt teachers, the episodic intro to this world, despite having its fair share of comedy, is also underpinned by tragedy and drama. Helping to frame the story stupendously and using these segments, Togashi builds up his characters by how they react to these peculiar circumstances and otherworldly happenings. And for Yusuke, our main character, and Kuwabara, a similar in-kind supporting character, it's fighting both of their natural instincts in order to benefit others. Now, not to sound like a nerd here, but I'm a big fan of tests in stories, and these early chapters are full of them. The most obvious and central to the story being Yusuke's test offered up by Ko Enma, but there's several others, exposing the true nature of not just Yusuke, but an extended cast of colorful characters. We watch as they are exposed to tests of courage, which ultimately reveal the true essence of their emerging characters. And by the time I reached the conclusion to these opening episodic chapters, I found myself not just hooked by a gripping narrative, but connected to and invested in the extended cast. Most most notably, Kuwabara, and I thought I was going to hate this guy, but he turned out to be one of the highlights for me, if not the highlight of these opening chapters. Revealed initially as a less skilled, less intelligent, and less everything version of Yusuke, I thought he was a thug and nothing more, something for us to see the differences in Yusuke with, but then he got his own chapter. In it, a snobbish and frighteningly belligerent teacher threatens one of his friend's very job, a job they need to help their family make ends meet. And with the only way to prevent this from happening being to not fight for one week and score at least 50% in the upcoming science test, Kuwabara's other friends are no bright sparks, but they have grades that make achieving such a feat relatively easy. But Kuwabara doesn't. On top of that, he's notorious around the city, meaning that not only does he have to find a way to learn the material, but also has to endure savage beatings without retaliation for the sake of his friends. And he does just that. In a single chapter, Togashi made me 180 my opinions on this character. Now he's arguably my favorite. It's a terrific chapter, probably my favorite out of the early material, and the way Yusuke watches all of this unfold with his own commentary is the icing on top. And that's when it got me thinking. On one hand, the nature of this episodic format can offer a ton of advantages to a newly released manga. Without an audience to read your new material, it serves your story rather well early on to not require prior knowledge of the story when you flip past a chapter in Shonen Jump. Would-be future fans could just happen upon any of these early chapters and be caught up in their self-contained stories, all the while slowly being immersed in the greater narrative or world. However, like with any story, I think it's quite brave to release effectively two volumes worth of manga without an emerging narrative throughline. The idea of Yusuke getting his body back is obviously the main point of interest for the narrative, but it doesn't really feel at the forefront of the story. It's a sort of thin vessel, a hook to keep us invested as he offers us a boatload of really thorough character work for everyone. And I think this is why you often see a thousand threads like, when does it get good for people attempting the anime? I'm a stupid moron with an ugly face and a big butt. But I really like it as a choice with the manga's pacing funnily enough. And like I said, there are two whole volumes worth of these episodic type exploits, so in the interest of time, let's lightning round these bad boys. The Sayaka stuff is cute with how it carries on the story of the dog kid from earlier. I expected it to be fairly straightforward with Yusuke taking on a raging ghost, but the subversion by essentially killing it with kindness was rather refreshing. It turns out you don't need to beat people up. Who'd have thought? In the next story, there's a two chapter stretch dedicated to two girls that are both friends and academic rivals. Uh, and I didn't really like it. It felt a bit too much like an after school special with its straightforward moral messaging. And without Yusuke really learning anything here, like in previous chapters, it's all a bit, I don't know, fillery to me? At the very least, it introduces some added texture to the way spirits can function within this world, but I don't know how relevant that'll be going forward. 
The next piece of story I absolutely adored was the chapter of Sayaka judging Yusuke and Keiko's relationship. The whole thing is utterly adorable, but what I find super interesting is how Togashi is somehow making me root so hard for these two despite their primary direct interaction being a few panels at the start. Normally this would work against a lesser writer, but not Togashi. Instead, he leverages the unique setting of his world and bunks all the conventions in the process. It's all of this indirect intervention from both sides that creates the unique bond they share, interestingly enough. She looks after him from the real world, all the while he protects her from the spirit realm. It's a fantastically written romance and a unique one at that. After that, we get a story about Keiko saving Yusuke's body from an arsonist. But what I noticed about this story was something very much secondary to the main plot. Keiko does demonstrate tremendous courage in that moment, and I love her emerging character, but we get a little more from Kuwabara here too. It's interesting how he's slowly being integrated into the actual story. We had his setup and initial characterization, and now we're seeing him come running to help and take in Keiko after the fire. We're really starting to get a clearer picture of this well-rounded character he actually is, with him very much being an analog to Yusuke in every respect. And finally, there's another double chapter story chronicling Yusuke's mission to help this little kid win a boxing match. It's sweet, but again, at this point, it's starting to feel like directionless filler. Yusuke isn't learning anything here, he's just teaching. At this point, it was definitely the time for the narrative to re-emerge, now that we're two volumes deep, and Togashi must have been listening to me because it does. With the first two volumes effectively introducing us to the story and its characters through episodic means, while it was fun, it is now time to get into Yu Yu Hakusho proper, a full dedicated narrative free of the constraints presented by the episodic formulation. And that means it's demon hunting time! And with the looming demon hunt comes the introduction of a series of interesting tools and gadgets to help Yusuke navigate his upcoming challenges. Right off the bat, early on he's given this eyeglass which helps him see through obstructions, and I think that given his first instinct wasn't to betray the trust of every single female on the premises, goes to show what kind of good boy he is deep down and that the only reason he lifted Keiko's dress up in the first place was because he knew it bothered her and he wanted to tease her. In addition to that, he's given the demon compass. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's a compass that points towards the bad guys. And finally, my favorite, the ray gun or spirit gun. It is friggin' awesome. But I think interestingly, the way it's implemented tells us a lot about Yusuke and reinforces my early claim that Togashi really understands how to drag the most out of his characters. In these sorts of stories, the first major technique our protagonist learns traditionally comes through a certain amount of trial and error training. One where they prove their worth and demonstrate the merit of their character by pushing themselves far beyond where others would. But Yusuke just does it. He's told how to and he does it immediately. However, there is more to this and it's a brilliant decision. The technique is given a limit. It can only be used once per day. And I think that is utterly perfect for someone like Yusuke. Nothing about his story thus far has presented him as this trainee or novice type character. He simply is who he is, win, lose or draw, and he doesn't lose often, let me tell you that. He's not like a Naruto or even really an Ichigo for that matter. He's naturally good at quite a lot when it comes to the physical and spiritual nature of things. So what did Togashi do to combat this supposed problem? Well, he targeted Yusuke's greatest weakness. This is the first time Yusuke shoots his ray gun, as audience members were entranced by this new flashy move and the swagger our main character exhibits using it. And personally, I was quite delighted because that dick hole had it coming. But little did we know that Togashi had granted Yusuke a technique that forced him to grow as a character. One that targets his greatest weakness, his rash decision making. His inability to think before he acts. The ray gun will only fire once per day, no matter what he does right now, no matter how gifted he might be physically, he won't be able to fire it more than once, at least not right now. And knowing this, he still decides to shoot it at someone who, while deserving of it, wasn't posing an immediate threat. He simply did it for short-term satisfaction. How do I know that Togashi designed this move to do just that? Well, because of the very next fight, Yusuke finds himself in moments later. Wait, <laughs> 
Narratively, this scene is cool as all hell because Yusuke is wandering up to these three notorious demonic targets like he's the one they should be worried about. I mean, seriously, you can't teach this level of swagger. It's infectious. But what I loved about this scene is that despite putting up a terrific fight for a 14-year-old kid, Yusuke loses to this giant, bruising, soul-sucking demon decisively. It wasn't even close. And it wasn't close in part because he wasted his best attack on something that didn't matter. Waking up from his loss and unconscious state, Botan offers him a ring that boosts his ray gun's power and now armed with that lesson learned, Yusuke finds that demon and puts him to bed. The fight is awesome. It has its ups and downs for the young kid, but God damn, does he keep it cool under pressure and execute cunning strategy on the fly exceptionally well. This is exactly the sort of development I want to see from this main character. It's exceptionally good. Thanks to the mechanics of the ray gun, Yusuke is in the process now of learning one of the most valuable lessons anyone can learn to put off short-term satisfaction in order to reach long-term goals. It's an exceptionally strong creative writing choice for Togashi, both visually and mechanically, for this character. Utter perfection. Now, of course, Goki is but one of three, and with this being the first segment of the series telling a substantial multi-chapter story, I was excited but largely expecting similar feeling battles that test Yusuke's abilities. And, well, it turns out Togashi managed to subvert both my expectations and my understanding of what demons can be in this story. You see, when you think of monstrous demons of the underworld, the design of Goki with all his ruthless personality traits is pretty much the de facto image that comes to mind. And yet Kurama could not be more different. His design is welcoming and his speech calm. His approach when meeting Yusuke is not one of aggression, but instead a plea. Quote, give me three days, then I will return the mirror. I just love how off-kilter that feels in contrast to what we've seen so far. And upon learning that the mirror will grant your deepest desire in exchange for a mystery offering, it's a double whammy of gripping intrigue. Pulling from Japanese mythology as the series so loves to do, it turns out that Kurama is actually a fox spirit with ties to the Nine Tails, and he was forced into the vessel of a human baby after a narrow escape from a bounty hunter. What follows is a spectacularly well-told tale of a spirit who learned to love his surrogate human mother as he grew up in the human world, who saw the sacrifices made and developed unwavering empathy in the process. So yeah, Kurama's human mother is dying and he needs that mirror to save her. Man, like, what a hook! And yet only a few pages later it's revealed the offering the mirror requires in return is his own life. This all takes place across a single chapter and yet it's one of the most powerful so far I think. In only a few short pages contained within one character, Togashi has added nuance to the demon world by producing a character with a motivation completely antithetical to that which preceded him in different incarnations, while also introducing and bonding us to the character of Kurama. And as the chapter comes to a close, Togashi links it all back to Yusuke. As Kurama is about to give up his life for his mother, Yusuke steps in and offers part of his own lifespan to save his. Calling back to the very start of the story, quote, You ever see a mother despairing over her lost child? I mean, wow. That is some seriously outstanding writing and what a way to flip my idea of the demonic outlaws on its head. Togashi is an outstanding character writer and one that really knows how to tug on your heartstrings in a very effective manner. That just leaves us with one remaining relic. Unfortunately, this seems like the point that Yusuke is most likely to run into a brick wall as it is held by the small but extremely menacing Hie. That name is... I wasn't sure how to pronounce I hope I'm nailing it. Uh, can I buy a consonant? <laughs> Even from the get-go, it's being clear that Hiei is the real threat of the trio. Togashi has proven time and again that he loves subverting visual expectations, so naturally the smallest and weakest looking of the trio is going to be the most dangerous. Worse still, he holds the most menacing relic of them all, a sword that can turn someone into a demon with even a single neck. From the moment Hiei sets his eyes on Yusuke, the up stakes are set out very clearly. With the chapter itself opening with an illustrative panel of Hiei and his blade in front of an unconscious or dead Keiko. And what's more is Hiei doesn't wait around for the plot either. Nearly interrupting a cute exchange between Botan and Keiko, he immediately swoops in, slashes her and takes her hostage. 
Togashi skips right on past Damsel in Distress and leapfrogs straight into Damsel has already been slashed by the Demon Blade and is in the process of becoming herself a demon. That sort of jump in stakes is an excellent way to further drive home how much more of a threat this final foe really is. With Keiko already struck by the sword and Hiei very clearly outclassing Yusuke in every possible measure, for the first time Yusuke is forced to face a situation that is, from the looks of it, truly completely impossible. And I love that, this sort of impossible pressure is pure gold in fiction and presents infinite possibilities with squeezing out excellence and character from our heroes. And then he announces loudly and plainly that there is a literal antidote to the demonization in the hilt of his blade. And also suddenly, Yusuke is faster and stronger than him? Okay, let's take a step back and reintroduce Hiei. This is Hiei. He's a moron. I'm a stupid moron. King of the tiny morons who does things like announce the only weakness in his plan to the hero and gets beaten up by the regular 14-year-old middle schooler, despite being an actual, real-life, super-powered demon himself. He is the sort of villain that will look us dead in the eyes and unironically utter the line, So, you're the sort who raises to the occasion when a friend is in need. I am so, so bummed out how this first big encounter played out. Togashi really had, in an incredibly efficient amount of time, mind you, built up Hiei as Yusuke's first real big threat and backed Yusuke into a corner that was ripe for excitement. But then, when the time came, it's almost like Togashi couldn't quite come up with a satisfying way for Yusuke to overcome these obstacles because it seemed to be impossible and just said, fuck it, we ball. Now, I'll admit, there is a very entertaining element to seeing Yusuke just trounce through most of this fight by sheer will of punkery alone. Seeing Yusuke literally threaten to wallop Hiei is just full of the exaggerated swagger of a Japanese teen. But it's just... It, it just undercuts everything Togashi had built up so immediately. Why would you literally announce an antidote? Why is Yusuke, who is again at this point a regular 14-year-old punk, able to keep up with and wallop an inhumanely fast demon? Alright, I'm stun locking myself. <clears throat> <sighs> okay, anyway. Hiei transforms into biblically accurate Hiei and uses some demon magic to stop Yusuke from moving. Thankfully, our old friend Kurama is able to jump in at a critical moment and make a save, throwing the demon version of Pocket Sand into Hiei's big ol' eyeball. Pocket Sand! With this, Yusuke is able to start trading blows with Hiei for a bit before losing his upper hand and being once again backed into a corner. With only one trick left up his sleeve, he fires a powerful ray gun at Hiei, who dodges it. I was not expecting that dodge, and that rug pull felt super reminiscent to me of Vegeta managing to dodge the Genki Dama in the Saiyan arc. That sort of oh shit what now moment works amazingly well here, and given that said Genki Dama chapter released just two years prior to this, with Togashi also very clearly a fan of Toriyama, I would actually be surprised if that wasn't what he was going for here. So where Dragon Ball had Gohan rise up against his previous fear and reflect the ball back toward Vegeta, how does Yusuke manage here? Well, as it turns out, Yusuke was actually aiming for the mirror relic, rather than Hiei himself. How did that mirror get there? We never saw, but it's there, and as it also turns out, the mirror is able to reflect back the spirit gun, or ray gun. How did Yusuke know this? Well, he didn't. He says so himself, and as it also, also turns out, Yusuke had scurried to a spot that happened to roughly line up with where the mirror reflected to, allowing it to directly hit Hiei from behind, and with that, Hiei is down. At the end of it all, Yusuke even explains pretty clearly to Botan that he didn't really have any plan or reason for the whole maneuver, and that it just happened to work out. It's a sort of that's the joke moment, and all credit to Togashi. By the end of it all, I found the whole thing so ridiculous that I was actually laughing along at the utter absurdity of it all. It definitely wasn't a fight that I actively disliked reading though, but what it was is a shining example of how new Togashi was to all this, specifically all this action manga business. By the time Hunter x Hunter had rolled around, Togashi had honed his craft on this front to the point where Hunter x Hunter is one of the premier, most well-crafted battles shown and arguably in existence. So it is really fascinating on an academic level for me to see the beginnings of that, to see Togashi, albeit very clumsily, finding his footing and learning lessons in the world of plotting an action manga specifically. And as a bonus, I have now mentally put a world's dumbest gremlin post-it note on Hiei's face, so that's fun. Genkai's Tournament. 
By stark contrast, the following arc is absolutely my favorite stuff I've read thus far, and a major contrast to the less serialized stuff I'd come to expect from this story until now. From start to uh, almost finish, it was completely my jam and exactly the sort of arc this story needed, full of humor, action story, and misadventures. We're thrown into the arc pretty unexpectedly as we quickly learn that Yusuke is attending a competition to become a powerful Reiki master's apprentice, mainly because an evil ability stealing demon named Rando, yep that's his name, is also vying for that very spot, which is not good I've heard. The twist however is that we have absolutely no idea who Rando is. This curveball added to an already compelling situation creates a captivating minigame of sorts for readers like me to partake in. Now we, the readers, are the spirit detectives, trying to suss out who the incognito demon may be along with our heroes. And even without that, the trials of Master Genkai's potential apprentice are quickly underway and rather unusual. No tests of skill or will, just drawing lots. Though it's played as a gag at first, it really serves to establish some of the wisdom and trickery that Genkai is capable of, as she has treated the individual lots to read to those with spiritual potential. It's clever stuff, really. The second trial is equally odd, having the remaining contestants play some spiritually related games, a punching machine to test physical prowess, a karaoke machine to test life, energy, or whatever that means, and a digital rock, paper, scissors machine to test their six senses. This whole round of games is not only a fun read, but does a lot of heavy lifting in terms of finally beginning to flesh out the mechanical systems of this world. Now we can finally begin to have explanations for things like, why can these teenagers, 14 year olds, punch so damn hard? And with both Yusuke and the Tagalan Kuwabara progressing through this round, we advance to the forest section. Having read Hunter x Hunter long before even knowing this material existed, it's remarkable how much of this forest section feels like the blueprint of the forest section from the Hunter exams themselves. Despite that, it's taking a very different approach. The Hunter exams forest section was gripping in the tension it established. So much time was spent there with the very real threat of death looming on the horizon for all who participated, particularly considering the presence of a particular killer clown. On the flip side, this incarnation is far lighter and humorous by design, and it's kind of interesting how Toriyama coded some of this material actually feels. Much of the humor wouldn't feel out of place with character designs like Batmaster even feeling evocative of the early Dragon Ball rogues gallery we grew to love at the time, but even with it being lighter, it still manages to do some great work in further fleshing out our heroes, this time chiefly with Kuwabara. While Yusuke does manage to make it in time by the skin of his teeth, demonstrating his physical prowess by beating the strongest threat in the whole forest along the way, the spotlight here is really on Kuwabara, further establishing his niche as someone with an incredible sixth sense. I mean, my boy Kuwabara arrives first place, mind you, strolling through the entire thing in no time flat. In these types of challenges, you often expect the main character to blow the potential master away by acing every single challenge in an unexpected fashion, but not here. I was grinning a smile the Grinch would be envious of from ear to ear when Kuwabara emerged from that forest. Did I mention he came first? What a chad! Now, at this point, because Genkai expected only one to make it through the forest, the final eight have to participate in a small impromptu tournament for the grand prize. And you best believe I was trying my best to find out who the imposter was. There was even a point where I was wondering if Kuwabara was the imposter himself. Maybe that might explain why he's doing so well. But by far, the more obvious apparent candidates at this time were certainly the assassin guy and the manji guy, both acing their trials and carrying with them an air of mystique. However, I am simply built different. I wasn't going to let some silly obvious answer fool me, the professional manga reader. Me? Ha! I figured that those two had to be misdirections. And after this page specifically, I was very convinced that this random ball kid was in fact rando. Not because he's the least imposing like I touched on, 
though that's also valid, but particularly because if you look at this page for a moment, you'll notice he is actually the only participant who doesn't get his own panel for his introduction. That sort of let's not pay attention to this guy paneling screams imposter to me. I was so confident and could not wait to see if I was right. Spoiler alert, your boy was! Congratulations, you played yourself. <laughs> But overall, everything before the tournament itself felt as though Togashi used his own clairvoyancy to look into the future and directly respond to my annoyance at the last few chapters. Addressing the roots of many of my criticisms, expanding the world, laying foundations for the power systems of the story, and helping me to care more about the extended cast. What had started as an upbeat series of spiritual challenges has devolved into a much more serious and dark sequence of death matches. I don't think anything reflects Togashi's writing style better, and it's cool to reflect back on how this same transition occurred in the Hunter exams. Korudo vs. Kazemaru Fittingly, the first of these quarterfinal matchups featured two new faces in order to establish the benchmark for what's expected in this tournament, as well as the scale of power these new foes boast. Shrouded in darkness, we barely see this fight, with the focus instead being on Kuabara's heightened perception as he takes it all in, while nobody else can. And what's more is Kazemaru serves up a ray gun from his palm that eclipses the best we've seen Yusuke produce. Suddenly, our main character isn't the most perceptive, nor is he the most powerful. Kazemaru emerges victorious, having narrowly killed his opponent, and with that, the tone change is super apparent. Shaolin, or Shorin, for those who only know the dub, defeats his opponent off-screen, another hint hint as to who he is, and with that we have our first matchup with one of our heroes, Kuwabara vs Musashi. This is another great showing for Kuwabara. While his ability to sense things has been at the forefront of this arc so far, this fight also emphasizes his capacity to remain calm and collected in battle. Despite Musashi cloaking his aura to avoid Kuwabara's detection, Kuwabara perseveres, eventually using a fragment of his enemy's weapon to create an aura sword. This level of improvisation is awesome to see as a reader and it impresses Genkai too. Kuwabara wins as a result, leading us onto what is in my opinion, the best Yusuke fight so far. Urameshi vs Kibano God, I love this fight. From the moment this fellow was introduced on a page early on in this arc, he stood out. Not just in terms of his design, but additionally in how naturally strong he is. Where Kuwabara was able to carve out his own niche against his own opponent, Yusuke is put up against someone who is just better than him. He had a better punching bag score. He reached the finish line of the forest first. Each step of this tournament has purposely illustrated how much better Kibano is than Yusuke, even in his own strengths. And that disparity, despite taking place in the pitch black, is certainly illuminated in the opening exchanges. Not as perceptive as Kuwabara, Yusuke is fighting entirely blind, all the while Kibano carries out his actions like a future incarnation of the Yusuke character might, one who has honed his abilities to overcome his weaknesses. Backing Yusuke into a corner like this with no obvious road to success, it created the perfect opportunity to surprise me as an audience member reading. This is cinema, and I love it because the seeds were planted long before the fight even began. Yusuke keeps track of Kibano, all the while leveraging his strength and ability against him. Using his cigarette, it's one of the most clever, creative, combative writing choices in this series, is totally in line with his character, and furthers Yusuke's path in becoming a fighter that's capable of planning ahead. Absolutely the best fight in this entire video. Don't at me, do people still say that? Or did it change because Elon changed it to X? I don't know. Kazemaru vs Urameshi. Sadly, this standard of combat writing couldn't last, and following it, we get one of the weakest fights from this tournament. With darkness removed, projectiles are fair game again, allowing for Death Stars to be thrown, and for Yusuke to have to navigate them. There's a bit of doubt surrounding Urameshi's ability to fire a decisive blow via the ray gun or not, but ultimately, the fight concludes with Yusuke coming out on top in a very unsatisfying fashion. Good old fashioned pure dome luck! My least favorite means of ending a fight. Shaolin vs Kuwabara. I enjoyed this fight and I think it conveyed what it needed to. Establishing Shaolin as Rando, see how smart I am, and the sadistic offbeat nature he brings to each encounter he engages in. 
but what it also highlighted for me was a missed opportunity. I complimented the inclusion of this mystery element into the story, tasking the audience to try to solve for who Randa was masquerading as, but what it also highlighted for me was a missed opportunity. I complimented the inclusion of this mystery element into the story earlier, tasking the audience to try and solve for who Rando was masquerading as, and while obvious to a certain extent, if you know what to look for that is, it's not how easy it was to figure out that was disappointing to me. It was how nothing of a role this Rando threat played in the story up until this very point. Despite being one of the primary reasons Yusuke is there in the first place, outside of that, he doesn't really offer much to this story at all until this very moment. Despite us not seeing anything in the forest section really, I thought it could have afforded Togashi an opportunity to implement some rando shenanigans, that he could have through the cloak of the forest done something to better tie him to the story. Perhaps he might have killed people along the way. Maybe he almost kills Yusuke, causing him to almost miss the cutoff time. Nothing happens with the character until his mask off moment, to the point that Yusuke jokes part ways through that he forgot why he was even there in the first place. It's a cool reveal, but I can't help but feel that the mystery felt a bit of a waste up until then if you ask me. In the moment, however, I think this fight, or rather beatdown, achieves exactly what it needed to. Kuwabara is a character that Togashi bonded us to quite effectively across this series, thus making him the perfect sacrificial lamb for Rando in order to fire up Yusuke and us by association. And boy, was Yusuke fired up. <laughs> Urameshi vs Rando Without warning, a vengeful Yusuke lashes out towards Rando, landing a massive punch right out the gate. After all he did to Kuwabara and all the torture he served up with that unsettlingly detached attitude, there was something enormously cathartic about Yusuke just getting to beat the piss out of this guy at will. And to be honest, most of the offense here makes sense. A consistent point of commentary and criticism over Rando's fights offered by Genkai herself has been how long his attacks take to wind up, leaving him open to Yusuke's natural and quick striking nature. Unfortunately, the final fight once again falls a bit flat for me. Perhaps it's meant to be endearing, but save for the Kibano fight earlier, every other time Yusuke has won an encounter, it has been due in little to no part to his own ability or strategy. Having just survived the fall into deadly waters while wrapped in aura webs, yes, that's an accurate sentence that reflects this story perfectly, and after receiving a pep talk from Kuwabara, Yusuke wins through, again, Sheer dumb luck! Against Hiei, it was the luck of a mirror reflection. With Kazemaru, he happened to fall into a bog at the exact right time. And this time, he had algae in his ears to prevent him from hearing Rando's incantation. I'm sorry, what? Algae? Has this happened to, I don't know, anyone ever? This is coming from someone who lives in a literal bog. I'm from Cork in the south of Ireland. The name Cork in Irish is Kirkig, and that literally translates to bog. I'm from the boglands. Algae does not get into your ears like that. It just doesn't happen. It's a real bummer and only further serves to emphasize how brilliant Yusuke's fight against Kibano was earlier. And that's the end of the arc. Yusuke is Genkai's new pupil. I loved 99% of this arc. Togashi just needs to brush up on how he concludes fights in satisfying ways. Lord knows he has it in him, he demonstrated it here. Hopefully he continues this trend. The Four Beasts It's funny, after all the trials and tribulations Yusuke's just went through to win the position of Genkai's pupil, you'd naturally expect a training arc of some description to follow. I was all prepped for a Luke Skywalker and Yoda training segment and instead got Goku getting to Kaio's planet only to off-screen the entire thing. Instead, Togashi decides to hard cut us to two weeks later with Kuwabara healed, Yusuke returning home, and a whole new world-ending threat on hand. Turns out a group of demons called the Four Beasts are trying to break down the barrier between the demon city and the human world by infesting people with parasitic demon things that turn them into murderous psychos. And as it happens, the only way to stop them is to eliminate the enabling whistle that allows them to exist in the mortal realm. 
Boom, setup done, and now a hard cut to the enemy base so jarring that even Togashi himself makes a joke of it in the gutter of a panel. Miraculously, Kurama and Hiei are here doing community service, and so Togashi has essentially done a speed run through all the party gathering early game content and dropped us flashbang in the midst of the final dungeon. And I do not use that video game terminology for no reason, because Togashi loves games. We've already seen as much with the mini games in the previous arc, and fans of Hunter x Hunter don't need me to bring up Greed Island to tell you that. For all intents and purposes, this Four Beasts arc is a video game, both in terms of its structure, scaling a tower of mini bosses to reach the final, but also the way the fights are written themselves. The villains here are based on the four lords of Chinese mythology. With the first battle taking place between Kurama and Genbu, mechanically Genbu can disappear into the environment forcing Kurama to search for tells, and yet despite that, his strongest attacks do nothing, except until Kurama targets his literal glowing energy core. Video games, am I right? While this definitely had the potential to be interesting, the lack of any real setup to the core weakness being discovered leads to it suffering the same sort of convenient resolution I criticized in the previous arc. Thankfully, however, the next bout between Byako and Kurabara doesn't suffer that same fate at all, and man does it dial up that video game inspiration to 11. The boss itself spawns mobs, and Kurabara sure does struggle until, wait for it, he funnels the pack down a narrow bridge, allowing him to gain the upper hand. I feel like Kuwabara would have been one hell of a Dark Souls player. Jokes aside, I actually really did enjoy the character work here in the first phase. Kurabara is such a funny contradiction of a person, his personality screams dumbass, and yet his actual perception in the midst of battle is really strong. He notices that not only is Byako absorbing the energy from his attacks, but he has a limit also and succeeds in overloading him. Phase 1, down. Phase 2 is the most transparently video game of them all. I mean, it's literally an acid pool with platforms that crumble and get destroyed by the boss if you stand on them for too long. I'm not entirely sure why the second part of the fight exists since there's not really any strategy or drama here. Kuwabara straight up yeets himself at Vyako and it's over. Which sort of leads me to believe that this video game framing device and structure device for fight itself are really more of a crutch for Togashi than they are uh, an inspired choice to add some flavor to battles. The fight with Seiryu and Hiei that follows is similarly brief, but holy shit is it cool. I mean, he just one shots the guy, which is sick in and of itself, but I love what it does for Hiei's character. He is so completely enraged by the fact that Seiryu murdered a pleading Byako, and Kurama notes that he sees a change in him also, perhaps brought on by Yusuke himself. The little rage gremlin is still an enigma to me at this point, but if these are seeds being planted for a redeeming turnaround a la Vegeta, then I'm all in for it. Which brings us to Sazaku, the final boss, and yet this isn't video gamey at all really. And regretfully, in a tragic twist of fate, despite the strong outing of these three prior bouts, the Yusuke fight is probably the weakest of them. But on a design front, this boss looks incredible, and right from the get-go, a bonus stake is added. Not only are the parasitic demon worms taking over, but Suzaku is specifically targeting Keiko. Now, I admit, I actually groaned a little when that was first established. It's the sort of half ass damsel in distress trope that leads to women being fridged, but Togashi surprised me a little bit here too. Yusuke's battle is intercut with a proper B-plot surrounding Keiko, who sure holds her own next to Botan. I mean, she straight up one punch man's a teacher. Additionally, the cutaways do feel a bit overbearing at times, but the core fight between Suzaku and Yusuke is far and away the most dynamic and well paneled fight so far. Suzaku uses lightning, which forces Yusuke to think on his feet, almost literally when he puts his rubber soled shoes on his hands in what appears to be a way to insulate himself against the electric shock. Except, wait, he was actually just using them to mask the concentrated aura in his fists, leading to a devastating blow. The Keiko cutaway kind of confuses the impact of this move, however, but I still love it as a concept nevertheless. And Suzaku's sure not hurting for strategy either. He splits himself into seven and completely overwhelms Yusuke, and unfortunately, this is the part where the fight kind of starts to fall apart for me. But it falls apart in a way that's 
very different from the endings of the previous arcs where contrivance murders the impact. This largely feels diminished because it falls back on a trope that is quite dated by today's standards. Yusuke has a flashback to his training with Genkai of a moment where he learns to push past his limits in the face of death, and with a vision of his friends and loved ones fading away, he powers up beyond anything we've seen before, launching his shotgun move. And although it's not quite enough to end the fight, the cries of Keiko echoing through his mind cause him to explode in new power, launching a devastating attack on Suzaku that obliterates him and destroys the command whistle. It's a relatively cool moment, but it's the embodiment of the power of friendship trope that is really just so dated these days, and has never really felt particularly satisfying or compelling even in the context of the years in which this device was common. But as down as I might sound, I did have a great time here. If its biggest sin is that it feels like a dated fight rather than a timeless one, then I'm exceptionally excited to see where things go from here. Rescuing Yukina what follows is less of an arc and more of a prelude to something called the Dark Tournament. It's funny, I did say at the start of this video that I hadn't the slightest idea what this series entailed, and yet as soon as I saw Dark Tournament written on the page, all my synapses lit up like a Christmas tree, and I realized that this legendary tournament I'd heard so much praise for was actually from this series. And guess what? I haven't seen it either. And man, given how strong this setup arc is, I cannot put into words just how excited I am to tackle that in the next episode of this review series. This prelude begins with the gang receiving an assignment from Koenma to rescue Hiei's sister, Yukina, an ice maiden who was captured by a bastard of a human called Tarukane. I feel like I'm definitely edging ever closer to the ruthless Togashi I know from Hunter x Hunter. The cruelty in this arc is utterly staggering, and I couldn't help but notice Togashi's author comments begin to mention his crippling back pain here also. Perhaps it's just a coincidence, but it's probably not a stretch to suggest that his writing becomes exceptionally dark when he's not in a good way in his life. Terukane is struggling to get Yukina to cry these days, so he calls in the Toguro brothers to fix things up. Their designs are so unnerving. One's a tall, mean-faced brute, and the other a tiny creep of a man who's perched on his shoulder. Togashi shows us that Yukina's only source of comfort in her captivity is through the birds that visit her window, and the Toguro brothers' first point of order is to crush them right in front of her. That's horrifying enough as it is, but he goes even further with a later flashback that shows a kind-hearted guard ruthlessly murdered for trying to help her. Things have always had a dark twist to them in this story, but this feels like a totally different level. From the very get-go, the Tugoro brothers have the most menacing presence and seriously gripped me. Villains up until now have been a bit of an underwhelming weak point in the story, and yet this pair really got to me like no other. The younger Toguro, weirdly the larger one, gets some proper development. Terukane tasks him with killing his monstrous pet to prove his strength, and yet he follows through despite his love of animals. That's nuance and a clear idea that this guy will follow orders no matter what. That's real setup here, and I honestly really appreciated it. Interestingly, all of that really stands in stark contrast to Yusuke and Kuwabara's side of these events. They're their peppy selves. Heck, there's a recurring gag of Kuwabara being head over heels for Yukina. As they make their way up to Tarukane's mansion with all the confidence in the world, they're unstoppable, taking down Toguro's men without a care in the world. What's fascinating, however, is that back inside the mansion, Togashi is using this to expand the world. Tarukane calls in an entity called the Black Black Club a mysterious group of rich individuals invited to place bets on how Toguro and his men fare against Yusuke and Kuwabara, the intruders. I kind of love the idea of humans and demons interfacing like this, using one another for profit and entertainment, with the darker inclinations of humanity acting as the point that bridges the gap between the demonic forces and the humans themselves. Of course, the majority bet on Toguro's men winning, but there's an anomaly here. A mystery is being set up that I love so much. A mysterious suave man called Sakyo bets on the human pair time and time again for some reason that's completely unknown to us, raking in millions and trillions as they once again continue to completely obliterate their opponents. Which brings us to the Toguro brothers versus Kuwabara and Yusuke. 
Oh man, okay, this is good. Prior to entering the arena, the human pair felt no threat, no demonic aura, nothing. And yet, when they step inside, Yusuke is immediately on edge, and for good reason. The smaller of the Toguro brothers twists himself into a goddamn human sword. Good lord, that's bad enough. And then... That is some classic, you underestimated my true power battle shown in type shenanigans. Togashi is seriously getting to grips with action writing now, and man, the pair get their asses handed to them thoroughly throughout this fight. After all the bravado early on, they are just completely outmatched for the very first time, like it's not even close. However, I was so ready to be upset again at this point. Yusuke and Kuwabara hatch a plan that involves the latter launching a Reiki blade at Toguro, while the former blasts him with a ray gun to increase his penetrative power. Some real badass, but also kinda convenient strategy like we've seen a thousand times before in this story. And hey, it works, or so it seems. Hiei shows up to save his sister and kick Tarukane's ass. Kuwabara gets a beautiful moment with Yukina. All is hunky-dory, neatly tied in a bow once again. Damn it, Togashi, come on, I thought we were better than this. But oh wait, I could not have been more wrong. One chapter later, and not only is Toguro alive, but he was working for that mysterious Sakyo all along and through the fight on purpose. This dude gets it, beheads Tarukane, as it turns out, he stole Yukina in the first place from Sakyo, and then marches off into the human world after Yusuke. Dude. He literally rolls up on Yusuke, tells him he used 20% of his power in their fight, and then forcefully invites him and Kuwabara to take him on in a fight to the death, dark tournament style. All the while flexing 60% of his power. Uh, okay, yeah, this is such a curveball Chad move by Togashi, and I would absolutely marry this story if it were human. Although... Those pages do be looking pretty good right about now. Hiei and Kurama are thrown into the mix, leaving a final mystery single spot in their team. And as the final chapter comes to a close, Yusuke arrives at Genkai's place with sheer determination on his face. He says, I've got two months. I need to be stronger. Much stronger. What a setup! I was so sure this was just another standalone arc like all the rest, but I have never been happier to be wrong. Togashi just laid the foundations of hype with ease. This truly feels like such a turning point in the story, and I cannot wait to see what awaits us in the Dark Tournament proper next time. I'm sure much of this video has felt, I don't know, a little alien if you've only seen the anime, as I've since learned that it cut a great number of these chapters in favor of streamlining the story's first saga. And while that may very well be for the best, I won't personally be checking it out until I'm done with the manga. I can't say I regret having read them either. There's a real beauty to seeing a mangaka evolve with their work, and especially being able to come at it from the angle of knowing what he's capable of later in Hunter x Hunter. In this video, I've had the real privilege of seeing an author originally only comfortable with comedy and romance make mistakes with battle writing and improve across these volumes. I've gotten to see his art evolve with it, and I'm so beyond excited to see what the future holds. Now, if you excuse me, I've got some reading to do.